My name is uh, Simon Howarth. I'm an entrepreneur mainly in biotechnology and now in agricultural technology and we have some amazing projects going on but it's all stemmed out of a very long engagement with China. This is the only time in my life where my job is to create a traffic jam, try and get more traffic on that bridge between the UK and China. My name is Toto, I come from London. My dad is Chinese, my mum is English, so mixed background. And I am a vlogger, model, host. I was 25 when I first went to China to live and began learning Chinese. It was always a kind of dream of mine to go there and finally, you know, become Chinese and explore that side of me. Hello everyone, my name is Max. I am a food vlogger. I lived in China for about 13 years, and then moved to the UK about six years ago. The way I see it is China is massive and there's many different styles and cuisines and cultures within China. I hope to spread awareness of all the different cultures within China. I think there's a lot to share. Well, now we're joined by uh, biotech and agritech investor Simon Howarth, uh, vlogger, model, and presenter Toto Guo, and food vlogger Max Burns. Uh, welcome. It's wonderful to have you with us. Uh, we have, of course, looked back at uh, some of your journeys there, but we also uh, w want to talk about uh, looking forward as well as how you built your relationships with China. Uh, we want to talk about how that understanding between China and the UK can, can develop further. And Simon, I want to begin with you because uh, you have a an enormously long-standing family relationship with China, six generations in total. Um, but also, uh, your, your business is looking to the future, isn't it? Uh, partly through your children who are engaging with China, but also uh, in business terms. What was it like, though, when you first found out that you had this, this very long-standing uh, history with China that you didn't necessarily know the full extent of? I'm embarrassed the amount I didn't know to start with. And uh, it was only on the return from a second trip, I think, to China that my father said, you do realize that there's, an, there's a suitcase upstairs full of China history from the family. And it goes back, uh, next year it'll be 150 years. Six generations in a row, silk, 1874. And the interesting thing is I can walk into the Jardine Matheson uh, archive up at the University of Cambridge in the library there, and the original letters are there, but the trade between Manchester or Macclesfield and China, silk. So it's, it's incredibly exciting, but of course I feel like a complete fraud. I started in China in 2012. This is minutes ago compared to my friends here. Uh, and so I'm just the sort of tenant of this experience. George, my eldest son, when he came over as generation number six in a row, uh, it's his generation that's really going to take it forward. But it wasn't your history, was it, that made you engage with, with China? It was uh, more the opportunities. No, it was the opportunities. I had a listed company here in London that I stepped back from, and I was looking for where in the world is there both money and market. And this is in biotechnology. And so uh, some of my friends said, look, have you investigated China? And so I went over, one of the companies uh, had an interest in uh, China that was just developing, went over there and we won a uh, talent grant in an unknown city uh, called Wuhan and set up the uh, business in subsidiary in 2012. So all biotechnology at that stage. So Tito, let's talk about uh, your, your story, uh, and it's something you have been sharing online, along with uh, your parents' story, who are here, I've seen. Yes, hello. <laughs> so um, what has it been like uh, bringing your story and their story uh, to a wider audience? Yeah, it's been crazy. I mean, it's been a real up and down journey and something we never expected to happen. You know, I was living in Beijing and literally my life changed overnight, you know, really happy, loving my work. Suddenly I find myself on a plane going back to London and my dad's health took a turn for the worse and everything was just really miserable, you know, and like lots of people, he had to stop working during COVID and we were just in lockdown and we just didn't know what to do next, you know. And so I remember sort of saying to him, you should, you know, check out this YouTube thing, give it a go. And uh, he turns to me one day and he said, 
my son, I watched this YouTube thing, it's rubbish, you know, didn't understand it at all. And I kind of get what he meant, you know, I wasn't really into YouTube videos and social media before, but I always knew how good a storyteller he was. And my mum is just so knowledgeable about gardens and garden design. And I thought, since we're all feeling so low, why not just record some stuff and share some stories? So I can't take all the credit. We had other people helping. I can't read and write Chinese, so we had someone doing subtitles and things like that. But it just slowly grew, and I think it really connected with people because it is very natural. It is a real family. And we talk about the difficulties as well as the amazing things that come from it. So it's been a really positive journey. And Max, you grew up in China, didn't you? But it was really only when you came to the UK that, uh, that you, your social media uh, journey uh, began. And you've got, is it three million people who watch your videos? I mean, uh, and, and as I say, who doesn't like to talk about food? It's food based, isn't it? Yeah. Um, how did it all come about? Well, originally I started making videos um, as a way to like keep up my Chinese. Um, and then it kind of just organically grew, like you said, into just something different. Um, it was like when I noticed my love for food was getting Chinese takeaway in the UK and just realizing how terrible it was compared to <laughs> actual Chinese food that I knew and loved. So after doing some restaurant reviews, COVID hit and you couldn't go to restaurants anymore. And I was, that was my main thing that I was doing, making videos, reviewing restaurants. So I started cooking food and that's how that came about. So this might be a slight generalization, but I would say that the younger generation are perhaps uh, more ready to engage uh, <laughs> with the online world. Uh, so there's, uh, yes, I, I would include uh, myself in the older part of that generation. No <laughs> But what I wanted to ask you really was that um, obviously you are engaging with young people through online, uh, both of you. But, uh, but Max, how important has it been, do you think, to try and make sure that that younger generation uh, has the bigger picture, uh, understands perhaps more about China uh, through the content that you provide? I think it's very important. Um, it's quite interesting for, for me uh, coming back to the UK. or I say coming back, but I've never lived in the UK before. Uh, 20, 2016, or well, yeah, 2016. <laughs> um, but meeting like loads of English people and having friends here that weren't Chinese and didn't weren't knowledgeable or immersed in the Chinese culture, it was like quite a culture shock for me. Um, and then making videos and going to Chinese restaurants and reviewing that was kind of like my only tether to the culture that I grew up in. Um, it's quite interesting, uh, some of my best friends around me, you know, I, I introduce them to Chinese food all the time. We go for uh, Chinese food or I introduce them to certain aspects of the culture and, you know, they've never seen anything like it or that, you know, like they're like, oh, I just, I just know chicken balls and <laughs> prawn crackers and then I show them. So I think it's really cool to be able to use food to share my culture that I've grown up in to people around me who are young people, just in a natural way. And then, yeah, I am sort of building bridges, I guess, mm. like that. So yeah, I think it's really important. And Toto, not the same experience, but again, perhaps younger people, although maybe not, who engage with, with your yeah, content. Definitely not the same experience. I'm a model, so I don't really eat. Uh, <laughs> so not so much food, but I think uh, in, in different ways, you know, like I try not to make too much focus on my videos themselves. It's more kind of a reflection of what I'm actually doing. So I think that, you know, like you say, this younger generation, yeah, they are getting more exposure to real Chinese culture. There's a sort of freedom to social media. You know, it's real people in their lives. But at the same time, it's quite superficial. You know, these are short videos. It's not a real window. So what I try to do is when I go do something real, like I organize a party and I'm inviting British mates and Chinese mates and, you know, doing things like this, uh, or going to model and, and sort of take a camera backstage and sort of show real little moments and, you know, I think that's much more important that you actually go out there and do things, you know, because we don't want this just to be something online. You know, there's there's great benefits of being up in online generation, but it's also not enough. Really. I think you have to really do it. And so I think that's the best way to really reach people. Mm. Yeah. And, and looking ahead uh, somewhat, Simon, you've started many businesses, a lot of them in China. Uh, when you look at the future for those and uh, for, for the economy and business more generally in China, what do you think the opportunities are? Where will, will growth and trade growth come, do you think? I, think? I think, first of all, we have to face, I think, some of the other panellists who talked about this before. China has been 
put in a place by some of the older folk. And in British politics, if you want to get everyone behind you, what you need is a really good common enemy. And China has been set up for that, for people who haven't even been. And it's been used as a way of uh, bringing people together behind a, someone who's got disparate views. And it's not even a known fact to those people. What we've got to do is break the barriers. We've got to take the uh, people who don't start with those prejudices and get out into China with those engagements. But the, the whole concept for me is people before politics. It's absolutely about connecting at the personal level because all the trade, all the rest will follow from that. And I think I started my China journey doing the pure business activity, beauty parade type pitches that everyone's familiar with, photographs, go home. And I didn't engage really with China. I set up a subsidiary by then and I didn't engage with China. It wasn't until I connected with Yu Tan Tan, this guy I call my uh, Chinese brother, that I got to really talk one-to-one -one about China and what it was like and engage with an individual. And I think the honest truth is we can do all the business events you like, but it's engagement at the one-to-one -one personal level. That is what will drive the future. And Toto, you're nodding. Do you think, do you think that's, that's what makes make a difference, yeah. a personal connection? Personal connection, yeah. I think you know there's gonna be huge advancements in business and academia and trade and all these different industries. But I think that until that perception of China as the enemy fades away, it's going to be very hard, you know, and we are on a down right now. And I always just wonder why it is, you know, that people, when they hear about Chinese over in the UK or they hear about Chinese in China, they always have this fear that they're programmed, that they're brainwashed, that they're not free. And actually, from my experience, from the people I've met, most of the young Chinese people here, they're very happy. They feel very free. And it's... It's just such a shame. It breaks my heart to see, you know, for example, when somebody says, okay, I'm, I'm from Japan, I'm from Korea, and I love my country. When someone says it about China, that I love my country, and I love being Chinese, there's always this sort of, mm, and a pinch of salt with which Westerners sort of hear this. And they don't understand that actually maybe free to them is not the same as free to us. You know, maybe parents here want their kids to be free to post what they want on social media, but maybe parents in China want their kids to be free to, you know, walk down the street and not, get mugged or, or, you know, get addicted to coke or something like that. There's, there's different ways and different senses of what being free means. And so I think that until that fear of China as this body and this machine fades away, which is going to take a lot of hard work and can't come overnight, until that happens, um, yeah, it's going to be tricky. But hopefully, you know, people can do positive things and just, you know, get together, open dialogues, and you know, hopefully we'll see change. But I think it'll be a slow process. And Max, you grew up here uh, and uh, you were saying before about how, you know, when you try to introduce your friends to Chinese food and, and they were kind of really surprised about the reality. Uh, do you think there is a, a bit of a knowledge gap between uh, what people think uh, they know and, and what they should know? I think definitely there's not enough knowledge about China being perpetuated like at all. Um, it was quite moving for me, for my friends, after introducing them to certain things that they go and I've sparked like a inspiration in them and they do go off by themselves and learn more about China and Chinese history and Chinese food and culture. So I definitely think, uh, sorry, could you repeat the question again? <laughs> no, no, <laughs> no, I was just saying that, you know, you, um, uh, I wondered if you thought that people thought they knew things and didn't about China and, and, and uh, you know, whether we could do more on that front. But let me ask you something okay. else, which is about, um, you know, you came to cooking uh, you didn't actually start out cooking. You kind of came to it by accident, yeah, didn't yeah. you? Um, so what are the differences between cooking here and cooking in China, do you think? Cooking here, so like cooking in England and cooking in China. Well, I know purely even utensils are different, aren't they? And oh, the yeah, way you cook yeah. things and, and yeah, to talk us through, um, you know, what you've learned and what you were surprised what's the, about. What's the same? <laughs> Not a lot. <laughs> but I think one of my favourite things to think about is like, I feel like, English culture and Chinese culture are very, very different, obviously. But that is, you can almost see it the most in food or the, see it the easiest in food because China, like other people have been saying, has this long, long history. And I think the food also reflects that because <clears throat> they've had a long time to develop like deeply cultural, uh, deeply 
flavorful dishes that you know come from a long time. But then England, I feel like, just doesn't have that rich, long culture of food, you know. So the flavors are very almost like muted here compared to. But we did make some nostalgic and right? yeah, yeah. agree that. So. <laughs> Not really, not really a challenge, <laughs> I, I hear, although uh, very popular still, very popular. unbelievably. Um, I wonder if we can talk about cross-cultural communication, because that's something that you, both of you really, but, but Toto, you're, in your family, uh, that's something uh, you've got first-hand experience yeah, of. Yeah. What have you learned about it? What, how, how should it work? How can it work? I guess, what are, what are the difficulties? Yeah, well, I guess compromise and, and patience and things like this are always key. You know, I think that it's really important to know that you'll never totally be able to communicate. I think there is this pure, raw, you know, harsh reality to the fact that if you haven't grown up with a language or in an environment, it's very hard to totally get it, but that's okay. You know, we understand what we can and the harder we try, you know, the, the further we get. Um, I think that I always tell Asian friends of mine not to be ashamed of their accent. You know, this thing called Chinglish, it doesn't matter. You know, people who are worth your time don't care about that. And in much the same way, I think that when we learn other languages, not just Mandarin, but any language, you know, the important thing is that when you push yourself and you lose that fear of mistakes and you just embrace it, you know, you'll find so many doors opening. Your whole life will change, you know. And so I have so much fun speaking Chinese. Now, honestly, sometimes my mates are like, has your English gotten worse? You know, because I'm just speaking as much Mandarin as possible. Um, and, it, and it still sucks. You know, I've never had any sort of formal classes and things like that, but I've been able to find a way to, you know, make friends with it and perform with it. And it's just been a joy, really. So I think it's, it's the key thing, communication, you know. And Simon, you, you, you said earlier about um, uh, the person you describe as your brother in China. Um, so you've obviously made this really close connection uh, with him and, and presumably others as well. Um, what's that brought to you? And, and, and as, as we were saying, how, how difficult can it be sometimes uh, communicating across cultures? It, it, can, it can be difficult. Mao Tai definitely helps. Uh, <laughs> but the um, concept of the Chinese engagement that has been stunning for me was I, I've been through three phases. First of all, it was this mystery abroad. Then it was this, oh my God, these two different cultures. But it's when I connected at the individual <laughs> level, that actually starts to go away. That starts to disappear. And the similarities is what's come through for me. But uh, Yutan Tan has helped me engage with biotechnology. Biotechnology is fascinating because there's two completely different ways of looking at human medicine. What we're now finding is that immunology is a link between traditional Chinese medicine and Western medicine. And there's a load of stuff happening out now with immunology, which suddenly makes the language of both sciences fit together. We've got the same thing with agritech, which is my new love in terms of activity. I think we can do more uh, benefit for the world with agritech than we can with my biotech actually now. And the engagement between uh, somewhere like China where the demand is growing is so important is absolutely critical for my industry. All the biotech companies we invested in have gone to China. All the agritech companies we're going to be investing in with a new fund now, China will be one of their most, if not the most important market bar none. But the only way you find out about these things is not from official documents and public records. It is literally just get out there and talk to people. Mm -hmm. And as soon as you get to know the Chinese and the character, the sense of humor is incredibly similar. The engagement is fantastic. So yes, the whole, the whole point I've learned from Tan Tan is that I learned nothing when I was looking at official sources, I learned everything when I opened the door to a family and to understand that. So you've identified China as an important market. Uh, you said that the baton of global leadership has passed to China. What do you think that means uh, for China and the world as a whole? We've talked about this slightly before. There's this really hilarious relay race going on, whereby the baton is being handed from one competitor to the next, but the guy who's got the baton now doesn't want to let go. And so you're watching this very weird relay race where the participants won't hand the baton over to the next person who is obviously going to be running the next leg. Uh, that is a period, I think, Stephen said, we get the period of, you know, 10, 30, 50 years of transition that we're now 
um, going through. But China, take, some, take the simple data. By 2030, the middle class in China will be the biggest group anywhere in the world. Right now, it's American, Western Europe. It absolutely removed that dominance. The demand of the market will be from the middle class from, from China. However, we have, I'm delighted to say, now got statistics that say population has got a peak. Population has a probably 2085, something like that. We've probably passed peak children. And we can now start devising agritech, devising food systems that are going to be capable of sustaining us at peak population only if we engage with Asia and engage with China. A positive note uh, to end on. Simon Howarth, uh, biotech and agritech investor, Toto Guo, blogger, model and presenter, and Max Burns, food vlogger. Thank you very much indeed for taking the time to talk to us this yeah, afternoon. Thank you.